Greetings, Embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you would like to become a member of the channel or buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links can be found down below. If you are new here or you have been here and not done so already, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help the channel out, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Stalker Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. I think someone tried to kidnap me once. I was walking home from work at 1 a.m. down the back alleys of a notoriously seedy gay area in London, behind the 24-hour club full of meth heads on 72-hour weekend benders. A brand new black Land Rover pulled up to me. The passenger window came down, and some guy asked me if I could dance. I know, right? Sounds weird. I laughed and said no. He said something to the driver, and then they crawled me. He told me there was a dance competition he could take me to if I wanted to make some extra money. I said no and kept walking. The car stopped and allowed me to get maybe 20 meters ahead. The car came back up pretty fast. This time, the driver wound his window down and told me to get in the fucking car. Otherwise, something bad will happen. I ran, and the car chased me. I mean screeching tires like a bad 80s movie. Luckily, I knew the area like the back of my hand and did a couple of nifty turns through some alleys that cars could not get down. I lived close by and managed to get home just fine. My boyfriend was waiting up for me, and I just walked into the house as if nothing happened. I don't know why I never said anything. It just sounded like a stupid story. In hindsight, I am sure that they thought I was a little method twink pouring out of the club. I also am certain that the person in the back of the car was somewhat notable. The car was out of place, swanky, and the guy driving was clearly a driver. There's a whole sleazy world out there coexisting and going under the radar. All right, this is my newest stalker encounter. I have been receiving weird emails from someone who posted a personal ad on Craigslist, Casual Encounters. The emails he sent me are sent to an anonymous relay address that Craigslist creates when you post an ad that then forwards it to my casual address. After some research, I have learned that this creep who is writing to me through this relay is someone I met briefly after her response to an ad I placed on Craigslist selling a house six years ago. Apparently, this maniac copied and saved that anonymous relay email address from my long-expired ad and decided six years later to use that address to email me. Now he is sending me emails that make me appear that I responded to his any ladies up in horny? Ad for March 22nd, 2013. The most fun part of this wonderful story is that I have another stalkerish ex-boyfriend who is constantly breaking into my email and Facebook and every other account who is now asking me questions about who this guy is and why I'm replying to NSA sex ads on Craigslist. Oh, it's so great to be a woman. How I love the creeps that come out from under a rock to harass. Six years go by. I couldn't have told you this guy's name if I had a gun to my head. But he's obsessing about me, which is really insane. Okay. 
Okay, here's my story, and it may not seem frightening to you, but it was a nightmare to me. A few years ago, my anxiety was high. I was already at a point in my life where I thought I was a little out of it. But that was amplified by a lot when I kept repeatedly hearing noises outside my window. Like every single night, it just wouldn't stop. I would finally get so freaked out, I'll go wake my parents up and get them to look outside, but they never found anything. I started to think I was going crazy or just subconsciously seeking attention. One morning, my grandfather discovered one of our lawn chairs beneath our bathroom window. It's pretty high up and the bottom pane is fogged, so I'm not sure the chair even helped, but it was left there regardless. The next night, I heard sounds again. Nothing. The night after, however, we checked outside and discovered something that made my stomach turn. A small stepladder was sitting directly under my window, back just enough to allow someone to sit on it but still see. On my windowsill was a bag of now cold McDonald, which is just up the street from me. Most of the food was still in there, but still, some fucker had been watching me doing absolutely nothing of interest in my room without me knowing for I don't know how fucking long. The cops were called. Nothing happened. I felt crazier than ever. No one has to be found out, but at least we had some evidence that someone that shouldn't be here was hovering around our house outside the window, watching intently through the blinds in a space between the two curtains. I heard noises the next night, ran outside, nothing. Earlier in the night, I'd sewn my curtains together which hopefully made it harder to see in. And apparently it did, because now the fucker had taken to climbing on top of our air conditioning unit. And from there, climbing onto our Herbie or garbage can, then standing on that so he could see above where the drapes went. The handprints and shoe prints were left on the lid to prove it. I should also mention there were now holes in my screen and I heard those holes being created. He took a stick and sharpened it somehow. We found it outside my window and was trying to stealthily break away the screen bit by bit. The hole is still there. The next night, I distinctly heard the gravel near my window crunch. There was simply no mistaking my sound. As stealthily as I could, I let out a small moan he surely heard and rolled just out of view, as if I were sleeping, then pressed myself against the wall out of view of the window. Very quietly, I opened my door and crept down the hallway. My heart was beating out of my chest. Normally, I knock on my parents' door, but I knew the slightest sound would make the bastard bolt, so I quietly opened their door and sneaked in then informed them that there was, without a single doubt, someone at my window. They didn't mind the intrusion and got up, got dressed, formulated a plan, and crept to the back door. I ran to the bathroom to stand on the edge of our tub and peek out the window, just as the back door was thrown open and my parents ran outside like morons. And sure enough, they saw him. They started screaming as the man leapt off the Herbie and bolted down our driveway, which was what I was looking at. They screamed all sorts of horrible things at the top of their lungs. You sick motherfucker, I'm going to fucking kill you. From my dad. You fucking freak. From my mom. He ended up escaping across the street, hiding behind a house adjacent to us. The balls on this bastard. He kept peeking out at us as we all stood outside, but we wanted to leave him there so the cops could finally nab him. They were called, they came, and they searched, but never found him. Bastard must have hopped over the fence or some shit. Still to this day, I hear noises outside my window, even in the dead of winter. But he's never out there. He might have just seen a peeper, but he targeted me specifically, and for months until he was almost caught. What really, 
really pisses me off is that once he lost interest in me because it was too unsafe, he moved on to another house down the street with two little girls. He actually managed to get it through the window, and their dad caught him just standing in the middle of the room, watching them sleep. He was touching himself, I do believe. I still don't think he was caught, even then. All I know is that it could have been way worse, but it messed me up. I trust the men in my neighborhood even less now. The men around here stare very blatantly. I've been chased home by one. I've had a guy try to jerk me into his car when I was passing him, telling him no, I didn't need a ride, and to leave me alone. All these years later, I still hear shit outside of my window and I freak out. It's pretty fucked up. I turn on my lights entirely to exercise. I do my best to avoid the window when I undressed. It just scared me and scarred me, even though it wasn't a huge deal, but scarred me nonetheless. So to you all, when night falls, make sure to check your windows because you never know who might be watching you. A couple years back when I was in college, I was the victim of a long-term stalker. I am a male, 20 years old at the time. It started out fairly innocuous on Valentine's Day. I started to receive a secret admirer type text messages from an unknown number. I assumed it was a friend of mine playing a joke as I was in my room with a handful of tech-savvy people at the party. I tried to gauge their reactions and ask if anyone was messing with me. They all denied it. And I believe them. They're pretty bad liars, by the way. It was further confirmed that it was none of them when I got a police call from the number. A voice on the other side said, Is this blank? My name goes there, but I'm not putting it in there. I replied, Yes, who is this? I'm hoping I could identify the voice. At that point, they hung up and resumed texting. Things started to get weird when the person began asking pretty personal questions, including repeatedly asking, Are you doing something tonight? To which I replied, Yes, I was working. But they kept insisting we should meet up. On top of all this, I was getting various images sent to me from a separate email redacted at textnow.me. This information, it wasn't a real number, and I now had a username to connect to the person. I don't know if it was their intention, but I actually enjoyed trying to figure out shit like this and took it upon myself to expose this person without giving away anything about myself. So I kept it up. I texted them back for a while and dug up more and more information about the person, compiling it into a profile and eliminating possibilities. Unfortunately, this just encouraged them, as they insisted I send pictures, take pics, pics add to the combo, etc. Then they sent a weird one, a white lacy dress hanging in their closet with the accompanying text, my wedding dress for when I marry you various heart and love emojis. They continued to pry about where I was going to be that evening, and I still refused to give details. Then, they dropped where I was going to be, a party on campus that night. I couldn't go regardless, I was working. Then, I got another bombshell. They asked if I lived in apartment 68, which I did. I recognized the style of apartment that they were in based on the picture from earlier. So I decided I'd throw a curveball. You live in this complex, right? What? How did you know? I recognized your door. All the shitty apartments had the same color door frame, which was visible in the edge of a picture they sent. 
the conversation kind of frizzled out here. I didn't go to that party and didn't get any more texts. Fast forward to October, the following school year. I was a senior and busy as fuck. One evening, I got a text from an unknown number. Is this redacted? So I played dumb, pretended like I wasn't freaking out that after many months, this person was contacting me yet again, and I still hadn't figured out who it was. These questions were instantly more personal and really weirded me out. Don't ruin the fun. Not knowing who I am is part of the mystery. I won't tell you who I am. Not now, too much to lose. I don't want to know. Not because I'm being cruel, it's just better that if you didn't know. I'm pretty tired of this shit and trying to work, but I do want to see if I can pick out any more details, so I'm doing the bare minimum to keep this going. This is December, the end of the semester. They proceeded to call me multiple times. I denied every call, but they kept coming. I think there were 14 calls that night. I finally turned my phone off. The following week, I was in the class IT-aid. Students were presenting their final work on their project, and I had queued multiple tabs on the projection computer. Two different students had worked on Google Drive. When the second student logged into their account, they didn't open a private window, so it logged out, the first student. I saw this happen, but the first student wasn't in the room, so when she came back, I asked her to rejoin. We were both standing in the projection booth. She was at one end of the computer, and I was messing with the sound system on the other side, but happened to turn and look at the projector screen when she was logging into Google. This hit me like a ton of bricks. The username she logged in with was the same username as the text now account that had been sending me photos. I quickly turned away and pretended to be busy with something until she finished opening her work. I thanked her and she left the booth without realizing her mistake. I tried to play it cool, but inside I was going crazy crazy for the rest of the class. After almost a year, I knew who it was. She finally slipped up, and I honestly, I was much more scared now than I had ever been. This person had a history of being pretty creepy around my friends, and although she had other personal reactions with me outside of class, all my friends had strange experiences. I met a meeting with a counselor who seemed to really care and offered to look into it. A couple weeks later, I got an email that read, The student is going abroad next semester, so we're not going to do anything. I insisted that at least something temporarily be put into place. They didn't do anything, but what did I expect? This school is pretty notorious for not giving a shit. I didn't run into her again. She hasn't texted me. So, for the time being, that is where this story ends. This was probably about 15 or 16 years ago. We had got the dog a few years earlier after someone came into our house in broad daylight and it felt to me to walk her mornings, afternoon, and night. One night, as I was walking her on a street a few blocks away, we passed an SUV stopped on the side of the road, whose driver was shining a spotlight on a second floor window of somebody's house. It struck me as odd, but there wasn't anything I could do about it, so I kept walking. At the end of the block, out of habit, I checked for oncoming cars or pedestrians and noticed the SUV had moved. The dog and I turned left and kept walking. Now, I like my city and it's a nice place to live, but I'm not under any illusions. I've been propositioned more than once by prostitutes while I've been out with my dog 
And one night, I heard someone screaming like a damned soul inside an abandoned building. City life is great, but it carries a few risks, and the city harbors a few predators. The dog and I turned on to another block, and a few minutes later, guess who showed up? Maybe I'm paranoid. The result of all the police reports I've read as a newspaper reporter, but I had the feeling I was being followed. I had no cell phone to call for help. It was well after midnight, and the only help I really had was a dog, who was pushing 12 when we got her. Another turn, another block, and halfway down, I see the lights of the SUV coming toward the corner behind me again. It was late and I was tired, but there was no way in hell I was walking to my house while someone was playing cat and mouse with me. I turned the corner. On the corner of my block, there's a bar with a parking lot that goes around the building in an L turn that goes from the road I was walking on to the one I live on. I got to the bar, ducked into the lot, and stood against the wall with my dog. Sure enough, the SUV drove past the bar and turned right at the corner. I watched as they drove slowly past and then waited for another five to ten minutes in the darkness with my dog in case they decided to make another pass. They didn't. The dog and I went home, went inside and left the lights off as I got ready for bed. To this day, I don't know what the driver of the SUV was doing why they were shining a spotlight on someone's bedroom window, why they decided to follow me, or what connection might exist between those two things. I love the city I live in, but I have three children, and I don't like any of them to be out when it gets late, not even with our new dog. I worked third shift at a convenience store, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. At that time, I was 20 years old and a single female. I worked the cash register until my coworker, who was also a female, worked in the food service area. One night, this gentleman came in and made multiple comments to me about how beautiful I looked, how he would love to have a young woman like me how I would make the perfect wife for someone. Overall, creepy comments that shouldn't be made to someone you just met who was trying to do their job and make a living. I tried to play nice with the guy, and he finally left, disappointed that I hadn't returned his advances. I mentioned it to the other girl I was working with after he left, and she rolled her eyes and told me that I needed to get over it. She also told me that I should be grateful that I was getting attention. He began to come in every night after that. If I was working, he would follow me around the store, asking me very personal questions, and inappropriate ones too. If I was working, he would ask my coworker about me, and she would readily give answers, even making some things up and telling him I was interested in him and playing hard to get. Yes, she was a bitch, and she wanted to make my life hell, but that's a completely different story. I finally told my assistant store manager about it, requesting a transfer off of night shift because this guy was making me uncomfortable. He told me that he would see what he could do. The next schedule that came out, I was scheduled for five nights. I confronted him about it, and he told me that I was the best third shift worker that he had, and that he would have the gentleman banned from the store. Well, that never happened. Things began to escalate. The guy would come in and beg for my number. He would try to give me money to go out on a date with him. He would sit around in front of the store for hours and hours. He even stayed all the way through the shift and tried to follow me to my car. Luckily, my stepfather had come up to the store that morning and had confronted the guy. Finally, I got sick of the man. I told him I wasn't interested in him. 
He needed to stop trying, and it was disgusting because he was very old enough to be my father. I felt bad afterwards because I don't like to be a rude person, and I thought I was going to get fired for speaking to a customer that way. The gentleman stopped coming in for about a week, and I thought I was in the clear. But oh boy, I wasn't. One night, about a week and a half since the last time I had seen my stalker, a bunch of police officers, several of whom I was friends with outside of work, came in. I spent a while chatting with them as they drank their coffee and then I went to perform my nightly cleaning duties. We had a mop closet that we kept all of our cleaning supplies in. It was in the back corner of the store by the restrooms and there were no cameras right there. So it technically was a blind spot to the store. I walked into the mop closet to get the mop bucket and a mop when I heard someone behind me. I thought it was one of the police officer friends and I turned to talk to them, only to find my stalker standing right behind me, blocking the doorway. My heart began to race in my chest. Uh, hey, how's it going? I asked him, going to prep the supplies I needed to mop the store. Ah, oh, it's going good, he replied, and at that moment, I didn't think anything was wrong. Have you thought about my offer? I sighed, crossing my arms. I told you I'm not interested. Before I could say any more, he shoved me full strength into the wall behind me. There was a bunch of brooms and other hard objects behind me that I crashed into. I don't remember much of what happened after that, but from what my police friends told me, I began to scream at the top of my lungs, and that's what sent them running in my direction. One of my friends said that as they rounded the corner, I was slamming the palm of my hand onto the guy's nose and attacking him. They tackled him, knocked him through the door we used for deliveries, and two of my police friends had to hold me back because I was trying to attack this guy, screaming that I was going to kill him. They pulled me back into the break room. My managers were all called to the store at 3 in the morning, and I had to fill out a police report. They photographed my back, which already had multiple bruises, and arrested the guy for assaulting me. My friend told me that when they took the guy to the hospital, he had a broken nose because of my fighting back and they had accidentally dislocated his kneecap when they tackled him. I quit the company shortly after because of this incident. I had told them repeatedly that I felt uncomfortable and was attacked because they refused to do anything about it. So that's my story of how I was stalked and how it ended. The guy is still in jail and I'm happily employed at a job that actually cares about the safety and well-being of their employees. Before I get into my story, there's a few things you need to know. First, I'm an artist and have always been very in my own world, as it were if I were thinking of a story or character or a picture I wanted to draw. I'd walk into walls and forget anything anywhere and place items in weird places while I was thinking. To give you an idea to the extent of this, my first place to look for anything I've lost is in the fridge or freezer. I've found remotes, my cell phone, art equipment, anything really. Second, I have always had a very negative view when it comes to alcohol or any other narcotics. I don't mean to shame any one of you listening to this, but it was always something I just generally regarded as pointless. However, if you find enjoyment in it, all the better to you. Third, I'm a very asexual person. I never desire sex or have any interest into finding a mate, so flirting usually flies over my head. And finally... Due to my childhood, I had a mild case of anxiety disorder, which has lately been worse due to this event and escalated by other ones. 
This particular story begins when I was at graduate from an upper secondary school for visual arts. Upper secondary is the type of high school in Scandinavia. I had decent enough grades, my best being biology and English, and of course, art. I immediately looked for work after graduation, since I had graduated half a year late because of some health issues and the entrance exams for universities were already done by that time that I had graduated, so I had around one and a half years before even the possibility to apply for university. I would send hundreds of applications to any place that would take me and hardly ever got even an invite for an interview. This took its toll on me and I got depressed. I hardly leave the house and I stopped taking care of myself altogether. I wouldn't shower, put on makeup, brush my teeth, nothing or anything. I'd avoid mirrors and I felt as though I was a complete and utter failure, which was not made any different by my parents who pressured me with, how many applications did you send today? Or, you really need a job so you can start saving to move out. This might sound mean, but they didn't mean it in a bad way, since I'd expressed the need to get out on my own and get a flat for the past few years. Not to mention, my relationship with my parents at the time was very strained, since my depression made me very irritable and angry so I can't really blame them for pushing me out of the house. This continued for around half a year until I finally got a job in a hypermarket around eight miles away from the place that I had lived in. Life was picking up from there and I started to take care of myself once again. The people I worked with were all very nice people and I had no issues with anyone. Though they were very normal so I'd get invited to get-togethers or to have a pint after work, etc. I always made an excuse why I couldn't go and would play MMOs or something instead at home. This might sound sad, but I enjoyed myself more than that. Fast forward a year of working, and I was accepted into my number one college university. And due to this, I cut my work hours to half, so I was only at work for two to three nights during the week. The particular hypermarket chain I worked at had a yearly festival week, gimmick to boost sales. And this year we were handed scratch cards to sell during the cashing out process. Apparently, the chain had a contest within every location and the winning hypermarket would be given a thousand dollars each prize for employee refreshment purposes. And they do mean booze. Our hypermarket decided we'd take everyone out for the night drinking in a hotel or resort area connected to the shopping mall. Our workplace was with the money. No surprises there. And since I had grown close with many of the other cashiers, I was motivated to win even if I usually don't enjoy going out. Everyone in the department was so excited for it. It was kind of infectious. Long story short, we won the competition and we went drinking. Our boss was so pleased with how well we did and how motivated we were, he even opened us a tab in the first bar we went to. So I had quite a bit to drink. When the first bar closed down, we went, on our own money, to continue into a nearby nightclub. I hardly remember anything else then that I drank like a sailor and sang karaoke horribly. We all stayed till closing time and I made my way to the train station to catch the last train home. On my way, I was stopped by a man with a thick accent who asked if he could walk me home. I laughed and just said that, <laughs> no worries. I was literally a few steps away and motioned towards the station. He then apologized and said he thought I lived in the student buildings nearby and went on his way. I thought that was a quite endearing way to ask someone out and thought nothing of it more. Another year passes by and I'm now living alone in a student block not far from my parents' home. 
The area I moved to was very poor since it consisted only of students. So in a weird way, I actually felt very safe living there. The walls were thin as paper, so everyone would hear if anything happened to me, or if anyone tried to break into my home, etc. Granted, I got an email from the company that funded the cheap student blocks that the bike seller in your address was broken into, but I never kept anything in there, so it didn't really faze me. Sometimes I even forgot my keys on the lock to the front door and wake up in the morning to a neighbor ringing my doorbell and standing there handing me my keys with a joking, nothing to steal, eh? There also was a very convenient bus that stopped right outside my door that I could take for both school and work, though I needed another bus to get all the way to work. One Saturday, after a nine-hour shift at work, looking and feeling like a total zombie, I was making my way to the bus stop through an underpass late at night, when I heard someone call to me through my headphones. Oh yes. I always stopped if I heard anyone calling me out when I was near work, since it usually was a colleague offering a lift or a regular customer wanting to crack a joke or one of the guys from a GameStop upstairs wanted to talk about Skyrim or something. I was basically friends with nearly every employee in the mall, so someone stopping me late at night in a sketchy parking lot or underpass was very common. I didn't recognize the man, but then again, I handled around 600 customers every single day, so I hardly ever did. I also was conditioned to flash a bright smile through years of customer service whenever I met anyone's eyes, even outside of work. I'm sure the ones who have worked in customer service jobs that long can relate to this. The man spoke hurriedly in a thick accent about how he was in love with me and how he had been watching me. It was very hard to make sense of anything he was saying. It was a stream of consciousness kind of thing, I guess, about how he spoke. What I did make out was that he had seen me in a bar, which he named, and ever since then, he had been watching me and never before found the courage to talk to me before now. I was unsettled by the choice of words, but I chucked to him not being a native speaker. I listened to him while I nervously eyed the underpass, feeling glad there were a few people walking through it during this whole spiel. After he quieted down, I just awkwardly said, <laughs> um, okay, thanks, but I need to go or I'm going to miss my bus, and turned to continue on, when he grabbed me and pushed me back towards the wall of the underpass. I was around 30 centimeters taller than him, but he had a lot of mass over me, since the most sports I had ever done was acrobatics and ballet, and I'd quit even that years ago. I considered punching him or screaming, but I felt it'd be better not to escalate the situation. So I sternly told him to let me go and that I needed to get to the station. He pleaded for me to give him a chance and said he wouldn't let me go before I did. I was racking my brain about the safest way out of the situation, so I tentatively told him, What if I save your number and I'll see if I call you? He had used this on another persistent suitor before, and it had worked just fine. Now I wished I'd never uttered those words. The man's face lit up and he started to spell out his name, as he was somewhere from the Middle East, while I pulled out my phone and hammered his name and number into my phone, sighing in relief. I was almost safely back at my home, and suddenly he grabbed my hand, and tore my phone from my hands. At this point, I angrily screamed, What the fuck are you doing? Give that back to me! But, to my horror, everyone had gone on from the underpass, and I was alone with this creep. And he ignored me, struggling and screaming completely, and calmly just called his own phone number from it, before handing it back to me, 
as if what he just did was completely normal. I just stared at him, terrified and dumbfounded. He then hugged me tight, copping a feel, and tried to kiss me. I hurriedly blocked his mouth with my hands and forcibly pushed him away. I didn't say anything anymore and just ran out of the underpass, and he didn't try to stop me. When I was safely at home, I blocked his number first and then deleted it, thanking my deity possible that when I moved out and got my new phone, my father had insisted on an unlisted one so he couldn't just find my address out on Google. I asked my manager to not give me the Saturday night shift for a while and explain my problem to her. I also asked if he could be banned from the store or something, but she told me she couldn't do anything before I filed a restraining order. Obviously, I had no idea what the man's name or number was anymore, not to mention getting a restraining order on him based on what I had as evidence that was very unlikely. A few weeks went by and he showed up when I was at work without fail, as if he knew my shift, even though I had a totally different shift every week. He'd just stare at me from outside the shop or by a single lollipop or something else cheap multiple times a day, paying with cash, so I had to extend my hand to him, which he always took and held for as long as there was no other customer in there. The horrible thing about this was, it was not unusual to get a creeper customer every so often. Every now and then, you'd hear them if you worked as a cashier, mentally ill or just socially inept. Desperate people mistake customer service as genuine interest painfully often, and you hardly paid any more attention to it than the other customers. Since nearly always it's a short-term thing, and kind of harmless. Basically, this man could have been stalking for God knows how long, and I just hadn't noticed. The thought that I only noticed this now that I had that earlier encounter with him was enough for me to lose sleep over and get a reoccurring sleep paralysis nightmare of someone entering my room and breathing heavily in my ear as a result. This went on, and it was now a few days until my four weeks of paid and four weeks of unpaid summer vacation. I had requested and given notice. The thought of not having to go to work and face this man every day was enough to perk me right up. So I threw myself into an extracurricular school project, a game for a museum's exhibit. One day, I had to stay at school working on a 2D rig for said projects until school was closing and the janitor ushered me out of the classroom. I had a little while before my bus was due to arrive at the stop, so I decided to catch some fresh air after working nearly 12 hours on the computer and walked to the nearby station that was at the end of the line. The bus was already waiting, so I rushed in, and after I paid the fee, and faced the back of the bus, my stomach turned. There he was with three friends, the guy with the thick accent, my stalker. We were the only passengers. I thought about getting off the bus, but the next one wouldn't be for an hour or so. Against all common sense, I decided to stay on. I sat on the very front of the car, hoping he wouldn't notice me. But as soon as the bus left the station, he moved to sit right next to me. And his friends moved to sit behind me, as if he knew this was the line I usually took. And just waited, so I couldn't exit the bus. I was ready to throw up. I turned my music so loud in my ears, it hurt. I ignored every tap and shoulder grab. I clenched my laptop bag on my lap ready to sacrifice my computer and smack him in the face with it if he tried to do anything else. Then the realization hit me. The line stopped literally on the front door of my building. My name was plastered on the front of the building. He would know where I lived. I felt as if I could burst into a howling cry any moment now. My thoughts were going a mile a minute considering everything that could happen to me 
if I didn't have a way to get out of this situation. I knew there was a longer stop coming up later, so I decided to try to make my break there. When the stop rolled around, my heart was pounding, I said. Music still breaking my eardrums. Uh, sorry, I need to get off here. And made my way to the mid doors. All four men followed me, speaking fast in Hebrew. When the doors opened, I stepped out and walked a while, before suddenly turning back and running like I was possessed back into the bus and yelling at the driver, Drive, just go, please, please, please go. The driver looked taken aback, looked at the men who were running toward the bus and back at my face, twisted into loud sobs, and how I was shaking, and he decided I was serious, closed the doors and sped off. He stopped the bus at a garage a few miles away, asking if he could do anything, call the cops or, you know, something. I just kept sobbing and recanted my first encounter to him, when something in my head clicked. The bar. He had specifically named it. It was the bar we went to, continue our drinking over a year ago, when we won the contest. I never before or after had visited that nightclub. He said he saw me there. He had been tailing me over a year. That night, he was the one who offered to walk me home. That's why he showed up at my work without fail whenever I was working. I sobbed, howled like a damn tortured cat at that, and the driver told me to go lay down in the back, and that he'd drive me home safely, and I told him it was the last stop. The driver dropped me off safely at home before he continued his round. Risking his job for my safety, I could not thank him enough, and I don't even know his name. After the second incident, I called in to work sick until my vacation and cut off my hair and dyed it black. I also only spent the vacation biking around my town during the day. Staying out of the town with my work and school was for the whole two months. I occasionally still sometimes have these sleep paralysis nightmares, but I never again saw him. A small part of me thinks it's because he doesn't want me to. One thing for sure is certain. I never left my keys in my door again. This super happy fun time experience takes place about four years ago after the neighbor ordeal. I guess my ever so endearing demeanor attracts unhinged folks. Anyways, I start working for a new job just after Christmas. The company I work for took over an account at a building closer to my home. So I transferred to the newly acquired location. After my first week there, some of the guys began to ask about my relationship status and take interest in me. This little ray of sunshine happened to be single back then, but I was not ready to mingle. I was focused on work, my family, and school. I was only there for about three months and didn't end up liking the new location, so I left for a better suited job. Imagine my shock when some of the workers wished me an early happy birthday and luck at name of the new job. It was a completely clown shit move. The manager had disclosed where I would be working. As I'm leaving, I see something I'd never noticed before. A phone list of employees with first and last names printed in the break room. One of many what in the actual fuck moments to come. I let the manager know he needed to move me from that as because I wouldn't be there much longer. He shrugged it off with attitude of someone who assumes an upset woman is having her time of the month, rolled his eyes and took it down. I was beyond thrilled to start my new job when the call started. Looking back, there had been maybe three prior to what I believed was the beginning of this, but they weren't as persistent, so I didn't think anything about it. Side notes. I have a tendency to bleach every red flag white. 
So please, trust your instincts and scary movie, run bitch, run yourself away when red flags are presented. I began to receive phone calls from a blocked number every single week, only Friday through Sunday, but with holidays, yay, and always between 1 and 4 a.m. I have a weird thing about the phone being near me and left it on the nightstand ever since of my sister's accident. When she said accident and they tried to call me about her, my phone was off and in the other room. For everyone who wants to ask why I didn't just shut it off or power it away, this is why. I will virtually throat punch anyone who says anything like, just shut your phone off in the comments. I'm an insomniac and light sleeper, so the calls actually woke me up. I tried answering them without saying more than a hello, but always just heard breathing. This had been going on for three weeks when my birthday came. Worked my new job, then the rebel that I am went and got a red box to take and have a pizza and movie night with my parents to celebrate. As I'm scrolling through the ridiculously dull selections of red box titles, my phone rings. One of the girls from my new job tells me that a guy who identified himself as my boyfriend had come and dropped off a pizza, flowers, and a card for my birthday. Confused, I relay to her I didn't have a boyfriend. She nervously laughs and says that she found it strange my boyfriend wouldn't know if I was off work and that he would need to leave my stuff there rather than give it to me in person. I thanked her, got my movie, and didn't give it too much thought. It was my birthday, so that was a problem for a tomorrow me. Next day, I open the card at work, and it's tickets to a place four hours away. In the card, there was a lengthy poem and details of the trip, complete with dates and hotel name the person planned to take us in. Creep factor raised, no idea who this is from. When I asked the co-workers, they could only give me a generic description. The weekend comes, and like clockwork, the call comes in. I decide not to answer, and now just decline the call. Life goes on. My mystery night and shining potential restraining orders never came back to work, and the calls continued. These calls went on for at least three years. I'll save you to insufficient life bits. But I have changed jobs and moved in those years. The calls did not stop until winter of last year. I tried answering and asking who it was. I tried screaming and cussing them out. I tried having my friend answer. I tried having males answer and threatened. Basically, I tried more than Sam I am trying to get you to eat green eggs and ham. A few times, they would have a song queued up to play when I answered. The more it went on, the more emboldened they became. They started heavy breathing again. I could only describe this as a masked Jason from Friday the 13th and a first-time masturbator, and then whispering my name. At one point, they ended up graphically describing what they dreamed of doing to me. I called the cops, who said without an actual threat, they can't do anything. Dreams don't count as a threat. I guess it was, I was told. I called the phone company to see if they can tell me the number of the caller who told me they can't disclose that and to call the cops. <laughs> well, when you see someone wearing my skin as a suit on the news, remember this day. Have a great day. I am now debating on changing my phone number. Personal legit reasons why I hadn't done this before. But also seriously concerned for who the fuck this is. For someone to be so committed to calling you every weekend of your life for that long is extremely frightening. One morning, after another two unknown missed calls, I wake up to a text from an unknown number. I'm greeted with an unsolicited dick pic. Fun fact, no one wants an unsolicited dick pic, folks. I respond it stating, if... Whoever it was ever contacted me again, their photo and phone number would be placed on Craigslist Men Seeking Men so they could get their own share of dick pics. 
I reverse search the number and lo and behold, I get a name of someone who I briefly worked with at the beginning of this story. It all starts to click that the calls started once I began the job. This guy would have known where my new job was and about my birthday since the co-workers and I had been working there. They wished me an early happy birthday on my last day. Him sending that pic solidified that he was the caller. Well, that's all folks. Anticlimactic. Ending never saw or heard from him again, thankfully. So, to everyone out there, if you see some weird obsessive guy or anyone following you, please be vigilant and careful. All right, dear listeners, this brings a close to these true stalker stories. I'd like to take a very special minute and thank the reform members of Back to Ashes. Tina Mead, Colt Stone Wolf, Mrs. Innerscare, Laz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, C.A.G., Denise S., Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Normie D.W., Chrissy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.